Although the U.S. empire deems itself the greatest democracy on earth, its election system is rigged, so people are given a choice between only two parties, the Democrats and the Republicans. Despite their differences, both parties are united around the interests of Wall Street and militarism, working to maintain a system that churns out disaster at home and abroad. Restrictive ballot access, biased corporate media coverage, and pay-to-play campaigns let this two-party dictatorship put a stranglehold on the process by making it nearly impossible for third parties to run. One of those parties is the Green Party. Despite being the fourth largest political party in the U.S., the dollar democracy system makes it so that they're only on the ballot in 20 states. Having evolved from a coalition of left-wing groups in 1984, The Green Party provides one alternative to the status quo, with a program of social and ecological justice. Since 2012, Dr. Jill Stein has spearheaded the party's presidential campaign, fighting to establish a bottom-up movement for real change. While practicing medicine, she authored critical scientific studies about environmental toxicity. Witnessing a broken medical system, she became a community advocate for just and equal health care. In 2002, Stein ran against Massachusetts Governor Mitt Romney under the Green Party ticket. She continued to elevate in local government until being chosen to run as the Green Party nominee in the most impossible election of all, President of the United States. Because the media establishment keeps third-party candidates hidden from all election coverage, I sat down with Dr. Stein to find out why her voice is such a threat. So, Jill, this is the second time that you've run for President under the Green Party platform. The entire political system is so corrupted. Uh, Knowing that, what made you take the leap to be that person, knowing how marginalized you would be? There are a lot of everyday human beings being marginalized uh, by our very corrupt political system. When you have two political parties that are funded by predatory banks and fossil fuel giants and war profiteers, uh, we got a problem. And, you know, I'm in a in a very fortunate position to be able to uh, continue you know, my participation in this movement. It's really a movement that has been fighting, and that movement needs a political voice. The Green Party is sort of the one, um, the one national political force that still has national um, scope that's capable of fighting at the presidential level. Was there a certain catalyst that catapulted you in just saying, I'm going to go for it? Even though I know what happened to Ralph Nader, I know that everyone's going to tell me what they're going to tell me, which is, you know, we're going to vote against whoever is going to be the, the Republican candidate. I mean, what, what compelled you to say, screw it, I'm going to throw my hat in and I'm going to stick with it? You know, I'd have to go back many years, <laughs> actually, to put my finger on that. But, you know, as a mother and a medical doctor, I had to be dragged kicking and screaming uh, into the political fight. And the only reason I did so was because I saw very clear from my position as a medical doctor what our, you know, the emer- state of emergency that mm. our health is in and has been for quite some time at a grand level. You know, we're in the sixth extinction right now. It's impacting our health in many ways, too, and that has to do with the burden of pollution, that we're feeling the economic um, stresses of poverty and homelessness, et cetera. We're not doing so well uh, on, on all those counts, and it comes back into our health. And when I began to work outside of the clinic, I used to practice clinical medicine. Now I say I'm practicing political medicine because it's the mother of all illnesses. Um, And we have to fix this one if we're going to fix the things that are literally killing us. So, you know, it was sort of my, um, you know, becoming clearly convinced, seeing the light that we had to engage in collective struggle, including uh, in the in the voting booth, if we're going to move forward, as the stranglehold of corporate government becomes tighter around our throats, uh, I think it becomes more clear to more people all the time. Just witness the revolt going on within the Democratic Party and mm. even within the Republican Party. The political establishment has no credibility, and they are terrified that we, the people, begin to get together outside of the two corporate parties where we can really begin uh, to build an unstoppable force 
to transform our lives now. And let's talk about the Democratic Party. Uh, you've called Bernie Sanders' support great. However, there have been other rebels within the Democratic establishment before that have ultimately just legitimized the party. Uh, what are the potential trappings his supporters should be aware of? Yes. Um, you know, the Democratic Party has a kill switch. When George McGovern was elected to, um, to be the nominee for the party back in 1972, the party basically decided that could never happen again, and they changed some of the rules of the game. So when you vote in the primary, you're you're voting for the delegates, basically, to the convention that are going to represent your state. But there's another process that was added on here by the Democratic National Committee, the DNC. The party established what are called superdelegates, which are not chosen by the voters. They're actually chosen by the party because they are elected officials or they are party insiders. And they tend to be very uh, conservative and they support the conservative candidate. And it turns out those are 20 percent of the delegates at the convention. So though that 20 percent, and Bill Clinton is busy rounding up those commitments right now. So he can uh, basically ensure that Hillary has the margin of safety. If she and, and Bernie go into the uh, convention neck and neck, or Bernie is even ahead, they can still um, basically sideline him using the power of those superdelegates. Uh, Dennis Kucinich was locked out of debates and then ultimately redistricted by the two parties collaborating. You know, so this is a scenario that uh, happens over and over again, and it's important to take stock of what it's what is its result because it's not making the party more progressive. The, it basically serves as a cover. It's a fake left while the party goes right, and the party becomes more corporatist. And it's important for people to recognize that the lesser evil that we're told to abide by really just paves the way to the greater evil. Uh, one fundamental difference between you and Bernie Sanders is Bernie Sanders is uh, proposing this jobs program, which is great. It's going to propose millions of jobs for workers. You're saying full employment right now for everyone willing and capable. We call the uh, our program a Green New Deal, and it transforms the economy. It greens the economy, not only um, uh, our energy system, but also our food and our transportation, and it provides essential infrastructure and restores ecosystems. So those are basically the focus of it, but it means everybody gets a job. Everybody who's capable and willing to work gets mm -hmm. a full-time living wage job greening the economy, and that means 100 percent renewable energy by 2030 so that we actually succeed in solving the climate crisis at the same time. We don't have to be the empire patrolling the world anymore, let alone the world's policemen. We can put our resources back into creating jobs and a livable climate right here at home, which is the source of true security. What makes you think the U.S. is an empire? You know, if the U.S. isn't an empire, has there ever been an empire? <laughs> you know, if you look at the portion of our, our, our budget, so it's like over 50, I think it's like 55 percent now of our discretionary budget, which is spent on the military. We have bases, um, you know, too, too numerous and too secret to be counted, but it's thought to be in at least 50, 60, 80, maybe 100 countries and uh, perhaps over 1,000 of them around the world. So no country has ever had that <laughs> ever in history. We have spent in the last 14 years $6 trillion, that's $75,000 per household that has gone into this endless war that we are conducting as this empire. Uh, for people who don't really know the historical context of how the New Deal was actually passed, I wanted you to outline that and kind of the biggest lessons that we can glean to apply to today's society. It actually didn't come out of nowhere. You know, it came out of independent third parties who were standing up for workers and workers' rights and for unions. It really grew out of the labor movement, um, which put things like Social Security on mm -hmm. the table. And it grew out of experiments at the state level. And it's important to remember that this fought, fight, the whole fight of the labor movement, was really carried out by an independent, by a whole series of independent third parties. Whether you were looking at socialist, communist, progressive, farm worker parties, etc., there were a whole slew of independent parties who were fighting the battle at the local level. And and so you had this multi-level political movement 
on behalf of everyday working people that forced the hand of the Democratic Party, which then began to adopt that agenda. And it makes the point that Frederick Douglass made, that power concedes nothing without a demand. And when the third parties folded and they joined the New Deal coalition and became part of the Democrats, that was essentially the end of forward progress. When you stopped having an independent base to push forward an agenda that wasn't controlled by Wall Street and corporations, the minute that political threat was reabsorbed into the Democratic Party, all forward motion ceased and progress began to unravel. And that has continued to this day. It's very important to recognize that third parties are a win just for existing. And the traditional sense of third parties is to really be um, you know, social movement parties. So you had uh, parties on behalf of the labor movement. You had parties on behalf of, of um, the abolition of slavery. And at the time that that social movement was thriving, uh, there was an independent political party called the Liberty Party that, that really formulated that threat and made it a political threat so that it could get traction. Otherwise, you're just blown off. You're marginalized and you don't count. So that agenda was then absorbed by another independent third party called the Republican Party, which was just forming at that time. And they began to win a whole lot of elections. So for people who say, forget it for third parties, they've never worked in this country, you know, they're, you know, they're not, um, they are defying the actual history here, mm -hmm. which is that not only have third parties actually achieved office and very high office, but that in fact forward progress has generally depended on independent third parties. They are a good unto themselves and we need to bring them back to the table. Of course the possibility of a woman becoming president would be just such a huge symbolic accomplishment. And Hillary Clinton is putting her entire bets on this, uh, Jill. She's really appealed to voters on this basis alone. Yeah, so you know, our campaign is kind of the inconvenient truth for Hillary Clinton. You know, Hillary has a track record, and you know, I think people are waking up to the fact that it's, it's the walk that you walk, it's not the talk that you've talked, because we've heard that. We need basic economic justice. Women are more vulnerable than anyone. We also need health care and complete reproductive health care. We're calling for a Medicare for All program you know, that provides complete health care, including complete rep reproductive health care, including the right to an abortion if a woman needs one. Um, that that should be just provided as a matter of course and not just to people who have insurance or who are impoverished enough to, to qualify for Medicaid. You know, there are comprehensive solutions here that Hillary is denying to women. Women are in a very vulnerable position and are more vulnerable to the, um, uh, the predatory economic policies that Hillary has thrown her support behind. So it's really important for people to know that there is a way forward for women. We're going to have a voice in this election. You don't have to sell yourselves, yourself out in order to support a woman in this race. Yeah, I, I personally won't be voting for someone who Henry Kissinger uh, writes letters to telling her what a great person she is and how much he admires her foreign policy. So, uh, you know, as a doctor, you diagnose people who are sick, obviously, based on their symptoms. Let's talk about the symptoms of our society and our system that we live under. What are the symptoms that you see that designate and that indicate that we live in a very sick society right now and that the system is corrupt to the core? You know, you could start with the fact that we're very sick physically, medically. Mm. We are very sick. We have very high rates of, of heart disease, cancer, high blood pressure, obesity, diabetes, uh, you name it. By any indicator, we are physically very sick and our longevity is actually declining. We are one of the few societies in which survival is actually going down. Uh, death rates are rising, particularly among working class people, uh, people who are economically being hit really, really hard right now. And we're seeing all kinds of, you know, rise in uh, overdose deaths and uh, alcoholism and, you know, sort of social diseases are really running rampant now, as are ecological diseases and the constant, like asthma. We have an epidemic of asthma. And and heart disease that are tied to air pollution. We have, um, you know, we have physical disease. We have poverty. Uh, we have an economy in which 62 billionaires now have the wealth uh, equivalent to what half the world's population, 350 billion people, have. This is sick by any standard. Uh, our political system is very sick. Our democracy is really on life support. Um, 
uh, when we were talking earlier, I was using the analogy that this is uh, this is multi-organ failure. You know, this is a patient on life support in the intensive care unit. I mean, that's what moved me to become involved politically uh, at the young age of 50 years old. I was not a political person. It was really a last resort after everything else had failed, after having been an advocate as a physician uh, working with community groups. So by any standard, you know, we have a society that is not going to make it. And the ultimate yardstick here is the collapse of the climate and the fact that we are in a, a major extinction right now, the sixth great extinction, where we are seeing um, you know, uh, rates of species collapse and disappearance, which are said to be maybe a thousand times uh, above background rates. So this is qualifying now as a bona fide extinction. There have only been a few of them in the history of life. The predictions now are that we could see half of the world's um, life forms disappear in this century. You know, this is, in my view, an absolute, this is a lethal illness that we have right mm -hmm. now. We have a lethal illness. Likewise, the climate is moving forward in a, in a um, very dangerous way. We could look at the collapse of the major ice sheets within the next couple of decades, which means a sea level rise between 10 and 30 feet. If you thought Pearl Harbor was an emergency, how about we lose all harbors and all population centers on all coasts around the world? We have a very lethal um, disease right now, which needs a cure. And fortunately, there is a cure, and it it is applied in the form of the Green New Deal, which cures the economy, cures the climate, and also cures the wars for oil. Jill, as a physician and, and working in medicine for so long, did you see anything that made it very clear that a for-profit healthcare system was woefully inadequate? And, and why does Obamacare not do enough? Uh, I mean, in so many ways. When I was in medical school, you know, I started working in a free clinic and I was just flabbergasted. You know, there's a free clinic on the south side of Chicago, um, you know, in extremely poor, desperate neighborhoods. And, you know, you just saw a two-tiered system all the way up, you know, and it's only gotten worse. Our, our, our health care system has been increasingly co-opted. Um, and profiteered so that the price has skyrocketed and our health is not improving, put it that way, so people have limited access. But, you know, it's like the whole thing is a sick care system. It's not a health care system. We are making ourselves sick and then we are pouring $3 trillion a year into a sick care system that doesn't hold a candle to what other countries are achieving with, you know, spending less than half as much uh, on health care per person. So this is a very broken system, not only because health care has been profiteered, it's been co-opted with, with the profit motive, mm -hmm. but also because we are making ourselves sick with a sick food system, uh, pollution, and a passive transportation system. This, these are the largest drivers of, of public health and disease. As a medical doctor, I was watching these new epidemics, you know, asthma, cancer, um, obesity, diabetes, and, and coming at lower and lower age mm. levels, especially in kids. And saying to myself, our genes didn't change overnight. You know, our, something's going on around us. And at that point, I sort of got recruited by some community groups to help them close the incinerators that were polluting their water supply and also their fish, making their fisheries unfishable that poor people depend on, and especially immigrant and, and native populations depend on. But it was really clear to me that our health care system is spending an enormous amount of money, and Obamacare basically guarantees you know, $400 billion you know, in, in profits. They create a captured market and spend hundreds of billions of dollars every year providing profits to the pharmaceutical and insurance companies. We don't need that. We had this in Massachusetts. We called it Romney Care. And what we saw under Romney Care is that we lost the safety net and people who are truly sick don't get the care that they need because mm -hmm. there are all kinds of holes in uh, Obamacare and the, the costs of, um, of the policies which are stripped down and inadequate. The costs are skyrocketing and the premiums and the co-pays are absolutely unsustainable. So Obamacare isn't going to do it. More of a profiteering private system mm -hmm. uh, is not the way to go. We need a Medicare for all system which uh, is rapidly achievable. You can expand it really quick, just change the age of eligibility and voila, we're all covered and um, for basically the same dollars, it covers everyone and all the things you need.
In 2012, Jill, you were arrested uh, for simply trying to enter the presidential debates. I mean, what was going through your mind at this time? Were you just thinking, wow, is there anything that proves more that we do not live in a democracy than what's happening to me right now, just trying to get my voice heard? My, my running mate and I were the only two people in this secret dark site. They had this converted... I don't remember what it was. It was a very large facility, and there were, Sherry had counted them, I didn't, but according to her, there were about 16 Secret Service and police who were around us in this huge, like, warehouse, mm -hmm. and it was only us, and then one other person who was brought we in. We were very dangerous. We were very dangerous. And the whole thing was so absurd, you know. It was so surreal. It was. I mean, we were sort of two grandmotherly types, you know, handcuffed to chairs, surrounded by Secret Service. And we asked, you know, well, do you think maybe you could take off the cuffs? Yeah. Are we that dangerous? A Gallup poll in 2013, uh, taken across 65 countries with 66,000 respondents, found that the overwhelming majority of the planet considers the United States of America the greatest threat to world peace. What would you do to end U.S. empire as president? The public is inclined to cut the military to start with, you know, when they're not being subjected to fear campaigns and smear campaigns. So we need to have an honest discussion. Uh, we need to clarify what a win-win it is to build real security. Then we need to cut the military budget at least 50 percent. We need to dismantle the bases. And we need to start by All of them. ending. Well, let's start by ending any new bases, because we are in the midst of creating that pivot right now to... Uh, to Asia, so there's a lot of very destructive base building going on right now and into Africa, which needs to be stopped. And then we need to dismantle the bases, starting with the countries where there's enormous movements to get rid of them. I think we also need a, uh, a pay-to-play protection so that if you prevent uh, anyone who has contributed to a political campaign or who has a lobbyist if you prevent them from being eligible for, for government contracting, then the energy goes out of this system. You know, you basically cut the military-industrial complex. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you sever the connection when they can't buy their way in and they can't buy Congress anymore. So then we can begin to actually have a real foreign policy, you know, that, that's good for us, as opposed to one that's incredibly destructive, uh, bankrupting us and uh, creating chaos around the world. Jill, let's address the whole throwing your vote away mantra when it comes to third parties. Uh, your response to people who say, I support you, I endorse everything that you're talking about, but I have to vote against Trump or against Hillary. Give them the benefit of the doubt because I'm finding a lot of people are waking up right now. So people that you could have wasted years trying to persuade, I'm finding are like suddenly seeing the light. It's really rather staggering. Why? You know, because it's like fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Fool me three, four, five, six times. People are beginning to uh, connect the dots and sort of see a pattern here that in fact this politics of fear that tells you you got to vote against your greatest fear rather than for your deeply held beliefs. This strategy now has a track record. And in a nutshell, the politics of fear has delivered everything we were afraid of. All the reasons you're told to hold your tongue and to silence yourself and to support the lesser evil. Because in supporting the lesser evil, we silence the progressive agenda. It becomes disappeared. Silence is not an effective political strategy. You have to stand up and fight for what we need. We have to articulate it. We have to put it on the table. We have to be a threat to the political establishment in order to move it forward. Otherwise, we are entrusting our fate to the corporate predators who have created this incredible mess. So the bottom line is we need to forget the lesser evil and stand up and fight for the greater good, like our lives depend on it.